This program is brought to you by Stanford University. Please visit us at stanford.edu. This presentation is delivered by the Stanford Center for Professional Development, providing graduate level education to working professionals online, on campus, and on site. For more information, please visit study.stanford.edu. Today, uh, we have Bill Buxton, who really goes under the needs no introduction flag if you're in human computer interaction. He has been uh, really a leading innovator and thinker in this area for uh, a long time um, and has worked with a number of the really important uh, groups and uh, research areas. Uh, he was at um, Xerox Park as a consultant there for a long time. He was worked with uh, Silicon Graphics. He had his own company, uh, he did alias, alias, wave, alias Wavefront. Uh, he's taught uh, for a number of years at the University of Toronto and some of the other major people in the field were students of his. Uh, he is currently working for Microsoft Research uh, and was, I just checked at lunch, uh, one of the instrumental people in developing their table that was just announced yesterday and other products that are not your standard old, you know, improving the Vista file system kinds of things. Um, but I think more than that, he has a real deep sense of design. His original training was not in computer science, uh, it was in music. And I think as some of you may know, that was true of Alan Kay as well, that people who start in the arts. Uh, and that's how I met you. That's how I knew your work. But that, I actually, that was, I was doing computer science and just dabbled there. Yeah. So, but for people who really have started in the arts and the music, I think there's a sense of what it means to do design and do interaction that is something that is really important to the way we think of it that you don't get by coming in through computer science. He has just written this book called Sketching User Experiences, uh, which is a great book. Um, it's got lots of good stories and examples along with the accumulated wisdom about what matters in thinking about how to make design happen. I guess that's the way I would describe the, the essence of it. Um, and he'll be talking about some of the things in the book today as well as some of the things from his many years of experience. Bill Buxton. Great. So thanks, Terry. So it's a pleasure to be back. And uh, so it If you were here last night, uh, I stayed up most of the night making sure that there was only maybe two slides in common, so you, you won't fall asleep, or at least you'll fall asleep for different reasons. And, uh, and what I wanted to do is just, uh, I, I did have about eight and a half years at a company called Alias, which, uh, Alias had, uh, was a 3D graphics software company, and it was a really interesting company in the following sense that it made 3D graphics for two industries. One, the design industry. So every single one of your cars, if you have a non-custom car, and even then, it was designed with our software. Your golf clubs, your running shoes, your eyeglasses, your wristwatch. Um, it's certain that three things you handled today came from products, came from, we're, 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 our software is used in that, or their software now, was. Uh, was used in the design. On the other hand, was in the film industry, entertainment industry, primarily visual effects and 3D animation. So uh, the dinosaurs in Jurassic Park and so on were made with our software. The uh, you know the melting guy in Terminator and uh, the finger in the abyss and and you know Lord of the Rings, but also video games. And so I was chief scientist, and my job and an executive of the company. And so literally, I had eight and a half years where I got to fly around the world to put on between one and 200,000 miles each year, talking to some of the best designers and best filmmakers, i.e. some of the most creative people in the world. And they thought I was doing them a favor by them explaining to me what they did and what their process was about and how they thought and how they worked. And I got paid for it. It was absolutely the coolest job you could ever have. And the problem was is that, and why I finally left the company, was when I could not reconcile um, the disparity and the difference between what our customers did and how they approached and how they did design versus what the software industry did. And so largely, um, at first I was just frustrated with my own company, and then I realized it was inherent in the entire industry. And then trying to sort that out, and so I started to pull away, work with things like bicycle design companies and people who weren't in the high tech, although bicycles are, 
are high tech, just different type of, you know, carbon fiber is not low tech. But the, but the thing was, is just trying to find out what it was. And, and, and I basically spent about the uh, better part of four years, three of them without doing, with doing as little real work as possible other than this. I could go consult strategically to make money or to learn and then go back to writing. And I literally bought every book in the bibliography. I literally read every book, not necessarily from cover to cover, but I went through every book in the bibliography because I really was trying to understand what have people written about? How did they, what's the theory around this? What's the practice? But also going out and talking to people and seeing what they actually did and trying to compare the two. And that, and that was the exercise. So I'm going to talk a bit about some of the things that came out ar around this today, and I'm going to try to not make it so that if you, you know, perchance go and get the book, that you're going to sit there and say, oh, man, he said all this at the talk, you're wasting my time. So to try and put a different spin on it. But, so I'm not going to regurgitate the book, although there will be some overlap. And I want to talk about sketching, because it, the whole topic here is about design. And there's been really, you know, there always has been, but all this stuff, on the one hand, you know, you've got Don Norman's books coming in, talking about design from one perspective. Um, Bruce Nussbaum, who uh, is the design editor for Business Week magazine, has uh, gave a talk at the Pratt School quite recently, he wrote up, and had a very strong rant, sort of an anti-design rant, and sort of said, stop calling it design, start calling it innovation. And, and there's all this sort of talking around it. And, and, and then there's all these people saying everybody's a designer type of thing. And I'm sort of saying, well, no, they're not. And I believe, so th my prejudice or my bias or stance is there is a profession called design. It's a specialized profession. They are just as specialized and just as highly trained as you might be if you have a PhD in computer science or, or a doctorate in, in, in medicine, for that matter. It is a diverse field so that just like in mathematics, there's people who are doing computational geometry and other people doing you know, algebra, whatever, whatever the disciplines of math are, or in medicine, uh, podiatry versus cardiology versus neurology versus anesthetists and so on. But that's still, they're still medical doctors. There is a, something called design. It is highly specialized. And everybody is not one of them um, any more than every, just because they do a little bit of design or innovation, any more than you're a mathematician because you count change when you come out of the grocery store. That, but, the caveat is that designers are the most inarticulate people in the world in terms of explaining what they do and, are, and, and being able to say it in a, in a way that distinguishes the distinct and critical and important and valuable skills that they bring to the table. And hence, as I experienced at my last company, the head of HR and the chief financial officer and the uh, chief counsel of the company had as much to say on matters of my area of expertise as I did. But to be real clear, I did not have an equal say about the books of the company or um, things. So, so let's, and so I'm not, but I'm not going to, I'm not intending to talk about this notion of what's design, but I want to talk a bit about what designers do, how they think. A little bit of cognitive psychology, a little bit about just sort of anecdotal stuff about behavior. But I want to center it around this theme of sketching. And you can sort of say, well, why about sketching? And the reason is, is that when I look at design as I think about it, there is this archetypal activity that ov overarching all design disciplines, architecture, industrial design, graphical design, where I cannot come up with an example where there is something taking place that I would call design with a capital D, the mathematics level as opposed to the arithmetic level, where sketching is not involved. And so I am not saying sketching is design, but when I see design, I also see sketching. And there's a relationship there, but it's not about the sketches. And this is a long tradition. Um, this uh, first slide just shows um, the first known example of using sketching as a tool of thought, as a way to think. And it's a guy named Tacola from the mid uh, uh, 15th century, and he's working through some different mechanisms for how to put armaments on a, on a boat. You know, so it's from the Renaissance. Now, people drew and sketched beforehand. This is a problem about one of these terms. It's used a lot, just like design. Drawing is not the same thing as sketching. Sketching is not the putting pen to paper, but it's the activity and the mindset that you bring to it. It's a situated activity. Okay. And so people d made sketches to remember. As, those are what I would call a memory drawing as opposed to a sketch. And, and they would record things or, or draw patterns. But 
this was a way to solve a problem, and you can go through several alternatives, and then if you go through the books, you can, act, they actually, you can actually track how he got to his final design from going through the sketches. It's an explicit history through the drawings to get to a design solution. And, and then it started. And, and the funny thing is, is and you'll, I'll talk about, you know, it's in the book, but there's a, I have a friend, he designs the track. He designs, uh, designed all of Lance Armstrong's bikes for the seven Tour de France, the time trial and the road bikes. And, and if you look at his thumbnails that he did, designing the world's technologically most sophisticated bike ever built at the time, probably, they're indistinguishable from these drawings in vocabulary. You can put them up side by side, and they belong right beside each other. D despite the, the you know, 500 odd years separating them. So let's dive a bit deeper into this thing. So sketching is the quintessential activity of design. And so let's, what, let's, let's push in this a bit and look at the kinds of things that we're designing today and, and having to deal with in our profession, in, in the technology sector. So I'm not joking, that really is my phone. Well, actually, it's not my actual phone. Um, it's just like Sine Puzzle and Peep. Um, that's not a phone, it's a picture of a phone, and it's a picture of the same kind of phone that I have. It's not a picture of this phone, so it's a, but you know what I mean, right? I just, I'm just, I'm Stanford, I have to be careful. So, I've talked about the importance of sketching and, and the skills around it, so, oh, I, I just used that word for the first time, skills. So I wanted, what, what, is, what is the skill? Because, what is, because that's part of the practice, because skills are learned, and therefore it's something that's important, it's acquired. Hey, it's that skill that makes me different than an electrical engineer or a medical doctor or a dentist. So here's the challenge. You can do this for real if you have uh, a, a tablet PC instead of a Mac. Um, uh, the, 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 uh, I won't do that. Draw my phone. How many of you feel that you could make? I believe that there's not a person in this room who could not. Who, does somebody have a phone that's different kind of phone than mine? What's yours like, Kurt? Do I hold it up? Let's see. Okay, so will we accept without a test that if we all drew my phone and Kurt's phone, that all of us could distinguish everybody's phone? We, we all could tell which was which from the drawings from any of us, regardless of what our skills are as artists, right? And you could probably tell that one, we, we're all sufficiently skilled to render, do a hand rendering of this phone and that phone such that anybody could tell which was which. All right, so that's, we're drawing the product, right? So here's the challenge. Draw the interface to my phone. Now this is a very important thing because in industrial design when we're doing the 3D form of this phone, you'll sketch and use sketching to draw the phone and we, we can easily transform our pathetic skills at drawing, unless you happen to be one of those people who was, is born, you know, was gifted as, with pencil. I am not. That I have no problem seeing about how to sketch the phone. I can extend my low level skill to what I've seen other people do. But even if you're good at drawing the phone, it's going to be much, much, much harder thing to draw the interface to that phone and everything that that includes because timing and all this sort of thing, right? And you're starting to see, but, but that thing has to be designed. And if sketching is part of design and the interface needs to be designed, then how do you sketch the, the, the interface? If you can't even draw it, how, without, if you have to think about drawing it. But we don't design interfaces. In some sense, we should be designing out of your faces. Right? But this is the third question. Draw the experience of using this phone. And now, even the best of you are almost as handicapped as those of us who are pen pencil challenged are in the first or second one. Right? Now, and the problem is I've used the word draw rather than sketch because I'm just trying to deal with something that you're, that you're familiar with without using a loaded term. But understand, all three of these things need to be designed, and therefore, if my premise is correct, then sketching is a fundamental aspect of the process of doing the design for each of these three levels of the design. And let's be very clear about, now, I actually I'll be clear, I'll talk about it in a second. Hold on a second. 
And, and so you have to ask yourself on this, which is the true design? Well, they all are. They all contribute. The experience comes from the form factor. It comes from the interface, but it also comes from the context. Because ultimately, design is, is, is design experience in a situated context where the physical artifacts and their affordances help um, you know, encourage one type of behavior and experience versus another. And, and then how do we, how do, we do that? And, and by the way, the most fundamental thing to be a good experience designer is to follow that quote. Everybody quotes, you know, you know, Alan Kay or, 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 or these famous designers. The most important person to quote in terms of understanding how to undertake this whole thing of experience design, of course, is Jimi Hendrix, right? Are you experienced? And your ability to be able to design experience effectively is going to be directly correlated to the breadth and depth of your own personal experience and that of your colleagues, which is why it's better not done alone. Because if you have a heterogeneous social network with a wide breadth of experience, then you have a much wider you know, foundation of experience in which to base your designs. What's important about this and where I'm going in this is that we are in the midst of a transition. It's always been the case, but we're, it, we're in the midst of a transition in our finally being able to recognize something architects knew well before industrial designers. But that what you design isn't a building. It's not the material object. It's not the physical object, what I call a materialistic view of design, the thing, the things that photograph well in, in International Design Magazine or these other fancy you know, things that look very stylish in these fashion things that have really expensive ads for Mercedes Benzes and, and expensive scotches and wines. It's not the object. If you can photograph it, it's probably not important. It's even harder to photograph experience. Actually, maybe not. Uh, it's, it's certainly hard to photograph the interface. And so how do we move from a materialistic where you're designing objects and things to design experiences? And anybody who thinks the thing that comes out of the box, you know, that you sell is your product, is just already lost. What you sell is the experience that what comes out of that box engenders, encourages, advocates, supports. And all the things it doesn't, that it prejudices against by biasing the path down this way versus that way. And that, so that's what we need to be, that's at the end of the rainbow. So, this, is a, this really is a mantra, which is one of the few times I'm going to put something on the screen that I'll actually read. I hate doing that. But we are deluding ourselves that we think that the products we design are the things that we sell rather than the individual social and cultural experiences that they engender and the value and the impact that they have. And any design that doesn't follow this axiom, in my humble opinion, doesn't deserve the name design. This as people want outcomes, not artifacts. Is that a good distillation? Well, the, it's the it's a, each ecological thing. It's not instead of artifacts. The artifacts obviously are a huge part of shaping the experience. I cannot experience screaming down a mountain, scared to death, flying over gravel, hitting a wet spot without my mountain bike, right? And but it's not it's not about the bike. It's it, but it's it's completely dependent upon the bike. Right? But it's the adrenaline, right? And, and that, in that case. And so it's a, there's obviously a tight relationship, and it's understanding those things that are, um, that are, that are important. And, and, and the fundamental thing now, when we start thinking about things in this terms, the challenge that we have, when I gave that example about draw my mobile phone, is the challenges when we start talking about the interface, when we start talking about the experience, is, is how do you deal with things like the element of time? And, and so I want to talk a little bit more about it because whereas I believe everything I'm saying about how the importance of sketching is fundamental to the process and so on and so forth, that does not mean that I believe the, tr the traditional form of sketching, the traditional way that sketching is undertaken, actually extends and can be applied as is to these new types of products where you are dealing with the experience, the experiential things that have to do with phrasing, have to do with gesture, have to do with time. So let's talk about picturing time. And we'll, I'm going to come back to this a bit. So a lot of us, um, these are some shots done by uh, some sketches 
uh, of an interface for a PDA that were developed by a friend named Ron Bird. He's a UK-based designer. He was working with a guy named Scott Jensen. If you want the best simple book on user interface design that I've ever read, of course, I'm not going to be able to remember the title, but it's in, it's in the bibliography, so if you look it up, you know, it's, there. it's Scott Jensen's book, and it's a really thin book. He works at Google now. I just... I hold him in extremely high regard. Really simple, really cheap, and to the point, and you can read it in an evening. It's, it's the, it's, it's, I really like it. Um, they were doing this, what most people do, these are a series of screenshots, and what a lot of people call these are storyboards. And these are not storyboards. These are a bunch of screenshots, and we'll talk a bit more about this. The time, in this case, is captured by showing the sequence through a series of transactions of sort of, if I'm gonna find a person on the agenda, uh, get them, make a call, and then, you know, compose the message. You know, you don't have to see the details. There's just, you've all seen this before, shot, 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 here's a sequence to go through and define the interface. And so that's, a, it's sort of like time-lapse photography is the way that they design the interface here. Notice, of course, there's no people in the picture. There's no context. There's no room. I'm not running in a car. I'm not driving. The sunlight isn't there making the screen illegible because there's a color screen. And, of course, we all know with most LCDs, you can't read them in the sunlight. Um, you know, that I, I love my camera, but there's no viewfinder. And when I'm mountaineering and hanging on a waterfall, you know, uh, on the ice like that with really bright sunlight, I cannot see a thing. And so I'm shooting everything blind, you know, display. But what is fascinating about this that makes a difference is there's one trick here that I love that I'll just use an example. Notice for the sequence, the subset of the transactions, he's got a little state transition diagram here that shows, and he's got these things labeled, so the numbers like 4A, 2A have to do with the rows and columns, where things are, and the, and the node where you are at each point is hi highlighted. So not only do you see where you are at a given time, each image has a set encapsulation of the localized context within the interface. So at least there's a spatial as well there's, there's two different levels of, of spatially representing time, one contextual and the other where you are on the particular path you're going through, and the sense of how, how you got there, where you might have otherwise gone, and what's the overall complexity. So it's actually sort of a nice little thing about how uh, he deals with time. And you can see it here um, in the blow up better. This is the, the initial page where you start from. You can sort of see what's the complexity of the subtree. Okay. And by the way, th there's this whole other part about the sketching that I think is really important, and I only have like one spread in the book that's about it, but it's the part that actually takes us beyond simply the, the sketching the form or sketching the activity. Of course, there's the back of the envelope uh, calculations and, and predictions and stuff because we have theory and actually using that stuff instead of doing formal keystroke level model things to, or, or formal GOMS analyses where I can really quickly, if I have basic theory, I can make really quick calculations. My hero in this regard is Phyllis Reasoner, who everybody ignores, but was at the um, IBM San Jose lab. And if you ever want to read something, which the paper I've ever written that I'm most proud of was a paper called Chunking and Phrasing. And that paper is on my web page. It's based really a lot on her work. And she was the first person to take things like this and be able to make you really pretty good quantitative predictions as to the complexity in learning. Okay, so we've talked about some of this stuff. I think it's pretty interesting. Um, for what it's worth, I, I was born in Alberta in a place called Edmonton up there. Um, and so I'm going to ask you a following question. What do Canada and transitions have in common? Come on, it's after lunch. Wake up. Test, yes. Quebec. <laughs> <laughs> That's a very good answer. Among us. Yes, it. Anyone else? Oh, uh, here's my answer. They're both dominated by the states. <laughs> right. Here we go. Yeah, it takes a while, doesn't it? I told you it's after lunch. Um. Here's a state transition diagram about my day. I have a really boring life. I uh, have a home, I have an office, and I'm always at one place or the other. I, I'm not going to tell you that, in fact, this means going downstairs to get to one or the other, but that's okay. I'll pretend that they're different places. There's home, there's the office, I walk there, I run home. That's the state transition diagram. I run to the office, yes. I also dyslexic. Now, 
what happens in nearly all cases where people are, you know, using the things like I just showed you previously to design user interfaces and so on and so forth, is they start mocking up screenshots. Because, hell, we know what screenshots look like. I can draw the screen. Let's be really clear about this. When I said draw the user interface, I know you can draw the screen in that mobile phone that was up there. That's not the interface. That's one instance of the interface, right? That's one state of the interface. But that's what people draw. And so they do stuff like this. They start to flash out the details of the states, the screenshots. And so you start having state transition diagrams that start to look like this. Opening screen, splash screen, moving the splash screen to this. And here's the pull down menu and stuff like that. And we go through, bang, 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 bang. And here's the whole sequence to go through this set of transactions. But notice the transitions have not been expanded upon at all. And I ask you, you know, where does God live? Okay. God doesn't live in the states. Well, actually, something would have you believe that, but we're talking about these states. Right? <laughs> yeah, yes. Oh, God. Don't get me started. Um, I'm easily distracted. Um, it, in the transitions, it, you know, there's all no things not the meat, it's motion. It's the transitions. The experience is so much in the transitions, in the dynamics. And here is my point. Unless you can show me in parallel or give me a really good reason, unless you can show me where you fleshed out the character and, every, and the aspects of the transitions at the same level of thought, rationale, exploration, and fidelity as you have the states, you're fired. One warning, you're gone. The design is in the transitions. And if you design the states, and then to, at the very end when you go to implement, say, okay, now we've got to make these things animated, I'm going to do all the animations and stuff like that, it will never happen. It will get dropped. Unless the transitions and the dynamics and behavior is there as a first class, the most important element of the underlying architecture and the whole system, you fail. And your design will fail. And you deserve to fail. You deserve to be bankrupt. But your poor bloody customers don't deserve that crap. And the fact is we have to change that about how we deal with that. We need to flesh out the transitions as much as the states. Yes? So would you call it a, a trick or an avoidance of responsibility to say, well, we flesh out run by Picture step one, picture step two, picture step three, and you know what we're doing, and, and then and then we have these smaller transitions or unexplained transitions. So there, there's a good example. Well, we, let's take a look at see what, who are the masters of dealing with time, in in terms of visual, right? How about Walt Disney? How about anybody working in animation? And if you look at what they do, is they're running off, and they're doing pencil tests. And they do the time before they do, and, and they do the timing way before they do the details. I saw Star Wars Episode One before they'd shot one foot of film. I saw the entire pod race scene finished. And what George had done is he'd taken scenes out of, out of uh, Ben-Hur from the, from the chariot race, NASCAR footage, all this crap, and spliced it all together. You have this chariot coming around the corner with, with Charlton Heston flying through the air, and all of a sudden it's, it's uh, you know, some stock car racer falling, you know, hitting the wall. And guess what? That was way, way more important to capturing that part of, which was one of the, you know, iconic parts of that film. Disney, everything. They do these things, just rough tests, and they're running these, 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 these pencil tests, and they're running... The animatics, absolutely all the time. And if the best animators in the world need to do this before they start to flesh out and do the keyframes, that they then, the details of, this, of the, the intervening states in that, that's all done off in, in, in Vietnam or, or, or places like that now, if it's not done by computer. The timing is everything. And, if, and, and that's just animation. That's not even interactive. That's linear. And when it starts to be interactive, and you've got these variations, how do you control that stuff? So 
I think it's about time that our profession, in terms of sketching and drawing, we've stolen the language of film. We use the term storyboards to talk about PowerPoint presentations that are, happen to be shown spatially instead of temporally. We have screen, 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 snap, screen, snap, that. Those are not storyboards. Rough drawings of screen sequences are not storyboards. If you study industrial design at the University of Syracuse, you take a full term course in nothing but drawing arrows. Yes, you can fail arrows. Right? You thought only the pioneers uh, failed because of arrows, right? No. Look, this is the sequence from The Graduate where Dustin Hoffman, when it finally got made, these are the actual. Um, where he's diving in the pool, and he dives down, he's swimming, and when the other guy comes up and sort of says, plastics. Yeah, remember? But notice the first thing. Look at the language of the arrows, that segmented arrow that gives a sense of acceleration. You get a sense of speed. It's growing. It's using stuff like that. But it, not only that, not only are there arrows and stuff like that going within the frames, but they go across the frames, and furthermore, they're augmented with annotation about what the other of supplementary annotation to the cinematographer as to what they're supposed to be thinking about and doing. It is not a bunch of encapsulated single frames with spaces in between like in many comic books. It is a flow. It is a wholly dynamic thing. And if you don't have that, I'm sorry, wash your mouth out for so with soap if you use the word storyboard. Because any self-respecting film storyboard artist is insulted or should be insulted by your co-opting that term. It's about time. In both senses of that, it's about time. We started recognizing it's about time. And, and this is what's really exciting. So now we're into some things where we've seen that you can actually use traditional sketching. You can use, there is some visual language that help us deal with some of the aspects of interaction, dynamics, and so on that I've been talking about. But it's still somewhat limited. and so. But there is still some foundation, some things we can learn from sketching. So I want to dive in to sketching a little bit more deeply so that we can sort of figure out how to get to where I want to get from where we are today. So I want to just talk quickly about, um, this is the 2003 time trial bike. Um, these are some of the first sketches that Michael Sagan at Trek did um, for the 2003 time trial bike that Lance used in the Tour de France. And and just take a look at that image. And the neat thing about that image is that it's clearly a sketch, even though it was done on a computer. And the th reason you know it's a sketch is you can just see there was no protractors. There was no rulers. There was no um, compasses or any other drafting instruments used. This was done by somebody freehand. It was done with large open loop uh, as opposed to closed loop gestures. It was done with a stylus. It was, and, and it tells you everything about that in terms of the vocabulary of the line. The visual language of this representation says this was sketched. One of the most important cues, besides the absence of regular straight lines and so on and so forth, is the fact that the lines go through the endpoints. It's a very important thing in the visual language to signal. In, it could, might as well be in flashing lights with a spotlight saying, I am a sketch, I am a sketch, I am a sketch. This is still a sketch. It's the uh, same bike a little bit later in the process, but it's got more detail. It's starting to be refined. Because actually, there's a, there, from a sketch to an engineering drawing, a sketch to a pr prototype, is a continuum. It's not, it's not an either or situation. And we're moving down temporally here. And now we're getting to something which is clearly done in a 3D model um, in alias with a, with, a, with a computer and so on and so forth. But you notice that he is still on this drawing, left the isoparms on the, of the geometry there, because what he's really doing is trying to see what, how do the graphics look on the carbon fiber, when, 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 what, what are they going to look like. And so he clearly does not make it photorealistic. He could have done so. He did not, because he does not want anyone thinking it's finished. Because he's, and, and this is one of my favorites, because here you have a fully formed, rendered, beautiful photorealistic 3D rendering from the computer of the concept. And look what he's done. He's dumb, dumbed the whole thing down by putting the sketches in there to extend the lines to tell you again, even though this looks finished and it's all 3D, it is not finished. I'm still working on it. And he's left those subtle visual cues there. 
and not put it in an environment to, like with the background erasers or other things you would typically do. Do that. By the way, th that's a really important thing. In, when you finally get to the point where you're making presentation drawings, what Nike does, for example, because they're making over 100 models of sh different shoes every quarter, and these fat people from New York who've never exercised in their life, you know, been out drinking, they're jet lagged, they smoke cigars, coming in, they're the buyers from the big stores that buy the Nike shoes. They can't remember 128 or more shoes every quarter. They can't remember where they had dinner. So what they do is they, every shoe, they don't sell shoes, they sell stories. And so when they do their drawings, there's palm trees, there's girls, there's balls, there's all kinds of other paraphernalia in the image sell the story. And that's what the people buy. The buyers that put them in the stores and stuff like that. This has none of that. It's just about some questions he's asking about the getting close to the final thing. And then we come back to the thumbnails that Michael does in the process of sketching. And I want you to look at those and you realize, hey, that looks like the very first slide I showed you. This is at the time, 2003, one of the most technologically sophisticated bicycles ever designed, and those drawings could have been absolutely on the next page of the Tacola drawings that I showed you on the opening slide. So what I'm showing you these for is to extrapolate from a case study, but you could have picked anyone, and it's actually really good if you have students or colleagues, get a sequence of drawings and get them to sort them in time. And you know, just give them all the dreams, tell them, put them out, tell them what order were they done in. Now tell me, what's the story? Why were they done in this order? What's, and what is it that lets you know that? What are the cues? How did you know that? Build up the language, build up the vocabulary, build up the, build up the sensitivity to how to read these things. But what we know, if we do the study overall, is that there's a, some attributes. If you go meta, one level of abstraction above, without talking about the specifics, what is the generic nature of sketching? They're quick, they're timely, they're inexpensive, therefore they're disposable. You don't have to keep them. Ideas are not precious. They're, they're, they're bountiful. There's plenty of them. They're in a clear vocabulary, so you know what they are and you know what they are not, so that nobody's going to get confused. They're at no higher resolution than is required to communicate the intended purpose. That is, you do not spend one extra line stroke on there if it's not necessary. You stop as soon as you card, because if you have extra time, you should be doing more sketches. You shouldn't be making more refinements on this sketch. Um, the resolution of the rendering that must not suggest a degree of refinement of the concept that's in act, that exceeds its actual position where you are in the planning process. The worst thing you want is your management or your, whoever's paying you to come in, look at what you're doing, and say, hey, that's great. Let's go with that. You must be finished. That looks great. No, you purposely don't want it to look great. Again, that's why Michael put those lines in that last rendering I showed you. And finally, they're ambiguous. And since I've left the, left the most important thing to last, what do I mean by ambiguity in this context? And here is the answer. A bunch of Emmentaler cheese. If you want to get the most out of a sketch, you've got to leave big enough holes for the imagination to fit. If you close it all in and you specify everything, there is no room for the imagination to play. There is no ambiguity. You're telling me something, you're not asking me something. And the most fundamental thing, fundamental thing about sketching is it's about asking, it's not about telling. That telling comes later, when you, that's what prototypes, when you know what you want. You have to leave big enough holes for the imagination to play. That's just the way it is. And that's why these things about resolution and rendering style are so critical. If somebody comes in early in a project when you're doing a user interface for a mobile phone, an MP3 player, a web page, or anything, and they've got these really nice, beautifully done screenshots, done in Illustrator or Photoshop or whatever, and they, instead of getting a bonus, you should just give them one warning if you're generous. I would get a new designer because it's, it's, it's an indication of, of something. They've left you no room. It's an insult. They've come in and said, I have the answer. I don't hire designers to give me answers. I have them there to ask me questions. And then they can find the answer, but not at the beginning. So the reason I went through this exercise of sort of saying, what is, at one level of abstraction, at the meta level, what is sketching? What is a sketch? Is so that I now have basically a set of criteria that when because interaction design has, isn't, has already been going on. 
how do I recognize a sketch when I see it if it's not in the traditional form? And the answer is really simple. If we have these criteria, I can just apply those metrics. Is it fast, timely, inexpensive, and so on and so forth? Is it ambiguous? Is it at the right level of resolution, and so on and so forth? And if it is, even though it looks nothing like Tocola's sketches or Michael's sketches, it's a sketch. And then, if I start to think about that, I can think about different media. How else? What are the kinds of sketches might I be? Because once I have that description to what a sketching might be, is, the attributes, I can start inventing new things that share those attributes and therefore improve my technique by inventing better and different tools to help me sketch. And that's the part for the, let's say, the meta design, the tool making part of, 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 uh, of what we do in our craft as opposed to the actual design. Now, in this whole space, there's a few things that I think are really important because I'm not focusing here on the business side, but I rewrote this book from scratch because it seemed to me it was a waste of time helping designers and industrial designers and so on work together and work better because it was a total waste of time unless the, the executives of the companies understood what they did, right? Um, the, if, 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 the, if there's not an executive level support for design, if there's, in my opinion, if you don't have a chief design officer who reports to the president at the same way that the chief technology officer does, then you should fire every creative person in your company because the executive, the, C, the CEO is saying to every employee, I do not take design and innovation seriously and therefore neither should you. And therefore, as a shareholder in your company, you're wasting my investment. Is did you see what we just did? Um, it's yes, y yes and no. But that's what I was hired to do, to help make that happen. Uh, I do not yet. I, I'm not the chief design officer. But if you just, the cover thing is, like, that, that there's not an accent that, have you, how many books have you seen Bill Gates write and endorse and say, this is what we're going to do? So yes, it's a company in transition. Yes, it's really important. No, it's not there yet. Although in some parts of the company it is. Absolutely in the game stuff. If you look at Jay Allard's group, absolutely it's there. Uh, in the mobile group, absolutely it's already there. You, and recognize each of those groups is larger than almost any other company you'll work with. So, so that's what we, the answer is yes and no. Um, could we do better? Absolutely. Even if we had it there, we, we could still do it better. Um, but, but Steve Jobs is not the best CEO in the world, but he's a really good chief design officer. And, but you can read about what I think about Steve in that capacity in, in, in the book. And, and, and I think quite a lot of them, actually, in that aspect. Pardon? In Microsoft or? He's already shown that, but I I had offers from both. Yeah, I know. Well, if you had money, you know. How much would you put? 50, 50 each? Hey, it's money saved. I'm with my wife, which is even more than money, right? Um, well, you went to the other one, but you did it, but anyway. Anyhow. Which is no, it's all. I just think it's. Uh, I I like good competition, and I think they're they're worthy. Um, there's a map here I want to get across because I think there's a couple things that are important that just tease out a little bit of the business and the management side of this. This red line represents how much money you've invested in the project in the design phase before we greenlight. At this point, we have still not made up our minds whether we're going to productize the concept or not. And from the beginning to here is where we put together what in filmmaking is called the package. That is. The business plan, the design of the business, the creative of the, of the product itself, and so on, and the engineering, the creative of the engineering. So let's say the structural engineer's job, the architect's job, and the property uh, investor's job. Okay? We invest as we go along. The weight, the criteria with which you accept and reject ideas, how you, tightly you manage things, should be like any gambling should be directly proportional to the risk. And the more I invest, the more rigorous I am as I go along because I have more at stake. But down here, easy come, easy go. Really informal, quick, dirty methods. Go as fast as you can, no problem. But recognize you're on a deadline. And you have to have the milestones to know when you change as you come along. But how you manage at the front end of the funnel is very different than how you manage at the back end of the funnel. This area is characterized by ideation. This one's got is characterized by, by validation as represented by usability engineering. Do not ever confuse yourself. We use the term user, user experience specialist and stuff like that to call the, the larger profession. Never confuse people who are usability engineers with people who are creative designers, just because they have the same user experience label. 
you need some literacy of each other's profession, but the person I want doing usability is somebody who knows statistics, is really anal retentive in many ways, doesn't mind watching 24 hours of videotape and, and, and all that sort of stuff. I do not do that. I'm really bad at it. You do not want me doing that. And I don't want them doing that stuff at the front end. We're all really good at what we do. We're, and each is essential, neither is sufficient. Know how to manage things and place people and do things, but also know how to bridge. How do you keep the designers busy here to fix the problems that the usability people uncover? Do not have usability people. Their, their job is to identify the problems and bring information there, not to, not to do the design. That usually gets fixed by the engineers. No, have the designers do it. They're involved all the way along. Likewise, up here, if you're creative, and we'll talk a bit about that, how do you get some really quick and dirty usability happening much earlier so that you, when you can't use predictive modeling and stuff like that? And of course, the whole thing's iterative. Um, but what I want to say is that what this process is, and I just mentioned this, this notion about sketching as I speak about it, um, as a very distinct thing from prototyping. And in my use of language, I am extremely careful about how and when I use those two terms, because they are completely different in intent. Because one is expensive and the other is not. I've given you the attributes of sketching. If, I have, if there's one flaw in the book, it would be I didn't do an equivalent thing of what's a prototype along the same things. So I, I, that would be a great exercise. If, I, if it was a textbook, I'd, make, I'd cop out and sort of say, I know, of course, I'm not going to tell you. And say, and, but really, I just haven't thought about doing that. But here, you do it as a student exercise. Volume two, yeah. Um, here's the deal. You sketch here, you prototype there. You can't afford. Every car company since Harley Earl did the 1927 Cadillac LaSalle, uh, after Sloan hired him at GM, has had a full-size clay model before it went, before the decision was made whether to go into production or not. Those clay models today cost over $300,000 to take two months to make, and they have a team of about seven people working on them. And they are indistinguishable from the final product. I, after eight and a half years of hanging around automotive studios, I still have to ask, is that real? Is that the new model you just haven't shown yet, or is that a clay model? You cannot afford to make five of those. But I can afford to make 30 sketches a day for each person on the ideation phase. Sketches are, are evocative. A prototype is didactic. A sketch suggests. A prototype describes. A sketch explores. A prototype refines. A sketch questions. A prototype answers. A sketch proposes. A prototype tests. A sketch provokes. A prototype resolves. A sketch is tentative. A prototype is specific. A sketch is noncommittal. A, a prototype is a depiction. And there's a continuum from here to here. And as the price goes up in a continuum, you're, you, and the management style changes, and your investment goes up. You have to start thinking about this. And we have to know where we are all the way along. And the whole team has to understand this. We have to be on the same um, card. So let's start thinking about sketching, because that's the part I want to focus on, because there's lots of material on prototypes. And if I can, if, as long as I just really clearly shine the light on one end of this continuum, uh, you can imagine fairly clearly where the far end of the extreme is. It doesn't have to be clearly done, but we start to understand there is a continuum, and, and we've got to shed some light on it here. There's, there's a woman named Goldschmidt who did a really nice paper that's almost impossible to read because of the language of, uh, one might say if they were pessimistic, the pseudo-intellectual uh, language used in the publication. But in, in a bit more plain speak, She's not the only one who's talking about this, that sketch, sketching is not about the sketch. It's not about the artifact. It's about the process. And the process is variously termed in the literature a conversation or a dialogue. It's a conversation between the person doing the sketch and the artifact. So it's a conversation or a dialogue between me and the sketch and me and another designer through the sketch or even between my sketch and another sketch that's beside it, which is why you want lots of them. So there's a multi-way through all these different societies. There's a very vast ecology that the sketch lives in this context. And as much as we can, we can talk about this. But what I want to talk about here is that it's this notion about you gain new knowledge. This is where the ambiguity plays into the whole thing. You gain new knowledge by you make something, and you get more out of it than you put in. That's what I mean about the holes big enough, the Swiss cheese thing, the getting the imagination. I make a drawing, and the person often who learns the most from the thing that they actually made was the person who made it. Oh, I, we all know this. When I read, when writing this book, I wrote it for pity's pity sakes, but I still read it, chapters of it, and say, oh, that's really interesting. I get stuff out of it, even though it's not a sketch. But, but 
I see relationships in there that I didn't know I put in there. Same thing with sketches. We've all had that. Um, and so you, you make the sketch. That's what uh, she calls seeing that. You interpret it, and, that, and, and, and you read out of that, and that brings in new knowledge, with which you then make another one. And so it's this, it's this conversation. And this happens between sketches, other people, and so on and so forth. But I want you to recognize if there's the making and the reading part. That's what I want to emphasize at this point. Sketching is not a unidirectional thing about putting from here to paper. There's a feedback loop that comes back to me. And that feedback loop is the part that is so often neglected. And it's a really important skill. And I want to make something really clear about this. How old is the person who made this picture of a house? Ballpark, seven. I don't know. I think, I think he's, it's my nephew. I think he's about seven. Was this done by a seven-year-old? It was done freehand. No. Okay, somebody actually understood perspective. They could draw. It's not a sketch, but they could draw a house. In your high school yearbook, you know, we all have our pictures. You know, you were the rock star. You were the one who could draw. You edited the yearbook. You were the football star and stuff like that. Um, you were the class president and so on and so forth. We all have these little things. And you were the person who was in the drama club and you edited, you know, so on and so forth. The people who had gave good pencil were different than the rest of us. They, there were people there who just were good at drawing. That, that was where their identity and everything came from. And everybody knew. I believe not only could everybody in this room, if we broke up into groups of five, and we all made a quick sketch in 10 seconds of my mobile phone, that if each group of five, without labeling, threw their five sketches on the table, and every one of you, and, and we numbered them, one, two, three, four, five, and then each person on a piece of paper was to write the rank ordering from best to worst, I bet you there would be a remarkably high correlation in agreement of who is the best drawer and who is the worst and, and who were in between it and in what order. Again, great class exercise. You can do this really simply. Test it. I, ha I haven't done it recently. But my experience is you get a huge correlation. We're really literate about judging each other's skill at making drawings. But here's the thing. And this comes from, oh man, it's a terrible font, isn't it? Sua and Tversky. They did a study here that was one of the best studies I've ever seen in this topic. I'm going to go back, because I want to go back to this. Because what I just talked about in that little exercise about drawing and the five people rank ordering each other's sketches and this great literature we have in terms of, of agreement and correlation and visibility about the make sketch, the seeing that part of things, is there's a visible artifact that reminds us so it is inescapable that I suck. And my wife and my son are like Matisse in later life with one line they can do an entire portrait. And it drives me nuts. Compare my stuff to Bill's, there's no comparison. But here's the kicker, and this is what Sue and Tversky pointed out, and why I love their work, is they said there is just as much differentiation on our respective skills on the scene as on the reading. And by the way, just because you can make good pencil doesn't mean you can read good pencil. One is the ability to draw, the other is the ability to design. And the reason that's been allowed to happen is because we do not have any visual artifacts to remind us about the, the ability to read. And here's the problem is, if everybody speaks English here, we're going to sit here and speak all the time. Aber jetzt sie spricht Deutsch, ja? Nein? Spricht jemand Deutsch? Ja. Ja, okay. So, so wir können beiden zusammen, ja? Ja. Und vielleicht die anderen versteht gar nichts. Okay? Wir hoffen nicht. nicht. Und, und, und dann, okay? Und wenn es in Deutschland war, ist es, okay, so the deal is this, right? You get used to speaking a language, you just forget that other people haven't got a clue what the hell you're talking about, if you're the minority. 
Designers are so used to working and reading and writing sketches. And that skill, they take it for granted and forget no one else speaks that language because that part, the reading, is invisible. And by the way, the foreigners, when they come in, they think that they can read. My mother, I know art. That Barnett new one, it's just a big piece of red. God damn it, I can paint walls. I know art when I can see it, and that's not art. And why is the National Gallery paying $5 million for that piece? Well, you know, there's a whole theory of hermeneutics and so on and so forth to explain that, but I'm not going to get into that with my 89-year-old mother. But here's the deal. It's really, really critical to understand that you are making a mistake if you show your sketches to people. You have to be aware of the literacy of people when they're reading and choose your rendering styles and what you d use them for when in the whole culture of design. And when I'm talking about sketching, I am not talking about presentation drawings to take your clients, your bosses, and so on. But there's one thing that this ekes at me here that my buddy Alan Kay said, which I wanted to kick him for not telling it to me earlier. And he made a really intelligent statement that has not been oft repeated, but I, I welcome you to do so, I encourage you to do so. And it is this, it takes almost as much creativity to understand a good idea as to have it in the first place. And my corollary to that is it takes even more creativity to actually bring that idea into practice than to have it in the first place. And the most important message I would have when I talk about sketching and what design professionals are, design professionals are the one profession who think that ideas are a dime a dozen and there is no such thing as valuable ideas in many senses. Your job is to have good ideas. If you can't have a good idea every 10 minutes, then you aren't a designer and you're not a professional. And get over it. Ideas are not precious. They are things to be thrown out. Designers and design is the most negative profession there is. It's not a creative profession. There's this whole funnel. We'll talk a bit more about it. You start off with a ton of things. You only end up with one thing. That means you're throwing stuff away all the time. And a lot of them are wonderful ideas that most people say, oh, man, I got, that's a great idea. I've never had anything like that before. I'm going to do a startup. Screw that. No, throw it away. Get the next idea. It's going to be better. And if it's not, you are got to learn from it. And just view it as a really high tuition for a very expensive education that you're going to learn something really valuable and then get on. Learn from the education. Build the, I, the G4 iCube Mac. Make that beautiful, horrible disaster. And Steve would never have succeeded had he not failed over and over and over again. Look at next. Look at the stupid round mouse on, on the first iMac. Look at the G4 Cube. Look at the third generation iPod. Design disasters. And he would not have succeeded had he not made those disasters. That's the point. Pardon? Beyond sketching there. Absolutely did. As do movies, no matter how, any creative endeavor must be built so that you have room to fail. If you are not failing, you're not trying hard enough. You absolutely, if an employee is always right, always in it, that is not a thing for reward. That's a thing to be pushing them to push harder. That, would, if that's the, that is the design mentality. Because you don't have all your eggs in one basket because you've got lots of ideas. And you've got it down. Bang, bang, bang. I said earlier, I'm going to try and wrap up because I think I'm getting close to time. But the, how are we doing? OK, good. Oh, great. We have, you have, might even have time for questions. <laughs> I said originally I was going to say give a definition of design, but I do have, for me, what is my definition for design to the extent that I will ever say one in public. And it's simply this, design is choice. And you sort of say, well, that's kind of anticlimactic. So could you elaborate, please, Bill? Well, OK, yeah. For me, there's actually, when you use that simple articulation, design is choice, there's actually two places where there's room for creativity in the design process. One is the creativity you bring to enumerating the repertoire of meaningfully distinct things from which you choose. The Bono might call that you know, lateral thinking and so on and so forth. And that's where the breadth of experience is so on. So often when people think they're making choices from among different things, they're actually just the same thing in different clothes. They're not significantly different. Like how broad and what, what, what's the real range of alternatives? And the second is once you've got that repertoire of things that you're considering, What's the creativity and innovation you bring to the heuristics according to which you make your choices? And those are 
the sort of yin and yang of, of the design. And, in some, and, the, and the clear thing is, you enumerate, and each one of those have to be good ideas, or they're not worthy to be there. You enumerate way more than you choose. Design is a negative thing. Ideas are not precious. They are there to be worked on. Now, Lasso, in 1980, published a paper, and he captured this graphically, the same basic thing, and he called it elaboration or reduction. Where on the one hand, you, you elaborate on ideas you're building up on that side, on the other hand, you're reducing them in terms of the criteria. You have, and, and, and that process of reduction, you'll read some literature around design rationale, and this is where design rationale really plays in. When you put something in, you want to be able to say, why is it distinct? That's one half of the, that's on the, on the elaboration side of the equation in terms of design rationale. And the other side is on the reduction side. What's the design rationale? One of the reasons why you want to actually do this not by accident, not just, I mean, gut's okay. But the reason it's important is that if you understand why you made decisions, down the road, when somebody says, hey, I want to change that, well, you can actually sort of say, well, actually, are the conditions that were in place that caused us to do that still in place? And if they've changed, then maybe that, that's valid. Or, you know, you can actually start, in, it, you're not re rethinking. You actually, it's, it's part of the process. And that, that, that's why trying to be somewhat explicit about why you're making decisions and why you think of these things are both there as candidates and, and why they really are meaningfully distinct. What's meaningful about that? So as you have meaning, that you're starting to have some rationale. But this, this graph by Pew, I think, is a much better characterization of what I call a design funnel. This is starting to look more, look more like the funnel that I used in the and that thing with the big red line, right? And, and this notion of the, 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 the design funnel. And, and there's, this, um, there's this part of the reduction part is what he calls controlled convergence. And the, and, and this, and the growth part, um, he, he calls concept generation. And so it's, it's more like a wave. So you're constantly, so the reason I, I want to put this is because what this really is, if you actually superimpose, this is a bunch of funnels of, of smaller gradations superimposed upon one another because this while I've here I'm doing ideation on the global concept of the product and I start to refine that then on the details the second order details I'm starting to elaborate and refine and then down here the the the, the control the, the concept generation is happening like I found a mistake in usability errors. The, the product's almost finished. Somebody came up with a, there's a usability problem. How do I fix that? Well, I use exactly the same design process, but on a, on a finer granularity of design. The process is the same all the way along. I have to go through the same, the same thing. And, and so you're always in the ideation phase. It's the granularity of analysis that, uh, as, as I come along that, that's there. And by the way, here's where we green light the project and we actually start to do software engineering and it goes off. Um, you still are doing design and usability right throughout the entire engineering process, which is the same if you want to think about it in buildings. The architect and structural engineer and business person are online first. They do the design. There's a huge interaction if you're doing an experimental or really risky building. Um, think about a Frank Gehry building or Rem Koolhaas building. The, 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 if I'm trying to do something radical, I'm going to depend really heavily and really early on the structural engineer. And the structural engineer may even, knowing my aesthetic, say, hey, you know what, there's this new material. If you just said this, you can get rid of this pillar and that pillar. You can open up this whole space. You have this whole new cup of light. You can make it all that more energy efficient and so on and so forth. And the architect runs with those ideas because there's this symbiotic relationship between the structural engineer and the architect. By the way, in software and tech high technology, we tend to know what we call an architect is actually structural engineer, and there is no architect, which is the fundamental problem. All our movies are made without a director. The, the challenge here is that notice, even though you've got a highly technically proficient person as the structural engineer and so on, and the consulting engineers along the way making the blueprints, they're not the construction engineers who actually build it. And if you look at the textbooks, the thing that drives me nuts is all of the textbooks about product design, especially when we talk about software product design, say software is different and design happens simultaneously with engineering. And the agile and extreme programming freaks will tell you that as well. And they, in my opinion, are just so wrong, it isn't funny. You would not, with your own money, start digging the foundation and have the earth movers in there and laying the foundation for your house on the very same day that the structural engineer and the architect come on, on the project. And that is what we do on software all the time, except there's no architect. 
The structural engineer does it all. And the, the, and the ironic thing is, the reason is we can't afford to have the engineers waiting and delayed. We've got to start building because we've got a tight deadline. We can't afford to have a team of 8 or 12 people working for two months, ever. But we can always afford to have a team of 100 of our most highly paid engineers working for an extra year because a product is, through lack of planning and design, a year late. And it's not just the cost of having that. Remember, it was forecast to come out a year earlier. The revenue was in the financial projections for a year earlier, so it's that lost revenue and the panic that's hitting your sales force for having to meet their numbers even though they don't have the product to sell. I've sat in executive rooms and in every company I've been involved with, the minute we begin work on a product that we don't know if it can be built, how it can be built, when it's going to be finished, how much it's going to cost, or what it's actually going to be, on the very same day we say, go ahead and start building it, is the very same meeting where they put revenue for that product in the financial projections down the road. And that happens in every software company you've invested in, probably. Yes? Windows Vista uh, had many of the same problems that uh, large software products have. And, and, and it's not, uh, and the thing that I found at every company and every company I've been involved with has these problems. Uh, uh, largely, they often, the good news is Vista actually ships and it works fairly well. Um, the, the, the worst news is, is that in more cases than not, uh, you invest two to three years of, of these teams and, and before the public ever hears about it, the products get, uh, they get canceled. And that is unbelievably expensive. Um, this is not the time to have that conversation. But if you do an analysis of software companies, you will see that there is not a, in my analysis, I cannot find a single software company in the world that has a track record of generating multiple pro new products in-house through any type of um, well-defined process. Um, if there are new products coming from a company in any statistically significant way, they are through skunk works. And the, but the entire industry is fueled by growth through mergers and acquisitions. You let the market decide, startups come, most of them fail, the ones who survive get bought by the ones that, the bigger ones. And Adobe in their entire history have developed precisely two products in-house, applications, uh, after they started doing the embedded stuff. Um, Macromedia did three. Microsoft's done a few more, but if you think of the scales of the company, those are about the same. Um, the, and that's not to say I have anything wrong about startups. There's nothing wrong about being bought. I'd love to have a startup and get bought. If anyone has a startup and they want me to come on board as an advisor, I'll come on board, especially if you can be bought by Google or some, uh, Microsoft and make a whole money. I think it's a great idea. I'm just telling you that, that I would also like it so that those startups have another option. That is, that they grow and build their own revenue by successfully bringing out product after product after product, as opposed to N plus 1 products, 1.0, 2.0, 3.0, 4.0, 5.0, 6.0. .0. And, and I, just, I just want another option. Because mergers are the second worst way to try and build your business. The worst way is to build them and fail. But, but there's a great book that Adobe commissioned and so it's trustworthy because it's in a way a vanity book that talks about their business. But I know from Alias and SGI, having lived through a number of acquisitions, uh, but if you want to read the Harvard, one of the top guys at Harvard Business School, a guy named Michael Porter, read what he writes. He's the, he's the classic, he's written a classic paper on M&A. They, they are a disaster generally in the long term because the people are geographically in different locations. You, the company has to be willing to be bought. You have to be able to afford it. You have to be able to get it instead of your competitors. Um, the, 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 just the financial packages, the remuneration of the employees is completely different than your company. They use a different programming language, different styles. They speak a different language. They're in Europe. They're in time zone differences, and you're trying to merge all that sort of stuff. At Alias, we're here at a company, 500 people. We were doing developing Maya in six different geographical locations. It's because of the the the, the the hodgepodge that came up, and uh, just like Adobe and everything else. And so what do you do? You shut them all down, eventually. Pfeiffer, P-F-I-F-F-N-E-R, -F -F I think is the author. Um, but it, I do an Adobe case study here and talk about their entire product line, and so you'll you find it in the book. Um, so what, where does, I'm sorry I got a little distracted there. Where, where all this takes us is into this notion about sketching and, and, and how this stuff works, but also what does it do to the, the basic process? And so 
um, there's a fellow named Gooch, G-O-E-T-C-H, if I remember correctly, from MIT, who wrote a paper, a, a, a book around this difference between contrasting designing versus engineering thinking and so on and so forth. But the way I would characterize it is this, is that the, the extreme programming, uh, uh, um, that, that type of agile development type of thing, or what, what we always called iterative design and so on and so forth, in the engineering perspective, really means that you go along, you just simply incrementally go around iteratively uh, following a path uh, to along a single trajectory. And that is not what designers do. Where, and designers do something very different. That for any time you have a problem, a question, the designer is going to come in with a minimum of five equally viable solutions. And, they don't, and they're going to come in without, without prejudice. They're not going to know which is the right one. And they're always exploring various alternatives. And, and so it's this branch. And so you're, you're, you're and you, to be able to explore multiple alternatives simultaneously, economically, and still finish the project, you need to have really lightweight, cheap ways to explore these ideas. And that brings us back into the whole thing about ideation and sketching. It is not, engineering is great. It's about problem solving. Design is also about problem setting. It's about getting the design right, but it's also about getting the right design. And by not doing this exploratory ideation work up front, you will almost never get the right design. But you might get a suboptimal design right. right. And it's really important to start looking at this in terms of we can do way better. And uh, this is what my buddy Alistair Hamilton, he's a VP of design of Symbol Technology, said. A designer that pitched three ideas would probably be fired. I'd say five is an entry point for an early formal review, distilled from hundreds. If you're pushing one, you will be found out and also fired. It is about open-mindedness, humility, discovery, and learning. If you aren't authentically, dedic authentically dedicated to that approach, you're just doing it wrong. And you're not going to get a job with him or any other reputable designer. It's actually interesting, that notion about, um, about uh, open-mindedness, humility, and discovery. And he's being so dogmatic. But <laughs> he's dogmatic about the things that matter. and. And, and this process, he will defend it to the death kind of thing. Let him go. Um, it's, it's, um, it's not a design of a process. It's just, it's just a, uh, a, a sense to just sort of show the parallel branches. Yeah. Yeah. They, here's, I, I, mean, I, I really mean this. I, I, I trace my culture that I come from. I'm Canadian. I'm North American. But the culture in terms of the intellectual world I come from, I've traced back to a guy named uh, Wes Clark, who was the architect of the TX0 and the TX2 at Lincoln Lab at MIT, following and up to the whirlwind. And then people like Bert Sutherland, Ivan Sutherland, and so on. And the whole TX2 group then hit the Ron Becker, who then came to Toronto and, and then I learned it through them. And it was a culture that I grew up in. And until I left it and went out to other organizations, I didn't realize that I was speaking German or English. That I'd, I'd lived in a, in a fool's paradise because I just worked with really brilliant, wonderful people. And all I can say is it's been my entire career addition to carry that through. And if you look at people like Brad Myers, um, Shubhan Jai, um, uh, Ravan Balakrishnan and so on, that, that were my students, and then their students uh, from James Landy, it, that, that that tradition has carried on. And the tradition is this, that when having a conversation, no matter how strongly you straight state your views, we're not wimps, but ultimately, when it comes to a debate, it has to be a fair fight. It has to be respectful. But actually, I'd rather be wrong than right. Because if I'm right, after our, our heated discussion, an animated discussion, all I've done is reinforce what I already knew. I haven't learned very much more. I've got a little bit more confidence. But if I'm wrong, you taught me something. And what would you rather do, be right or to learn something new? And if you'd rather be right, I don't want you working for me or with me. I want you out. But the neat thing is, if you work in an environment where you foster that culture, you never have to fire anybody because we're all the same thing. It is infectious because of the respect that that brings within the organization. 
So those notes that are dangling where people's ideas were left, that's fine because, gosh, I'm happy to leave that because you had a better idea. And guess what? It's like this desk. I did not make the surface computing thing that Microsoft came out. It built on my research. I talked to those guys. Andy Smith and Steve Batish absolutely did it. They have the credit and deserve the credit. And that makes me feel better because my research had some impact. It influenced them, but, that, but they did this work. And, and it's, I, I don't feel like, oh, God, those guys are taking my turf and that sort of stuff. No, that frees me up because they were doing it. And I knew that, and I'm talking to them when I can. That lets me free because I'm doing some other stuff. Because quite frankly, I did that stuff a long time. I don't want to go back to those things. And actually, I don't have the technical skills to do what they did either. They're smarter than me in those things. And the attitude about that is, is that everyone, I don't want to, I would never take a PhD student who isn't smarter than me. Because if, if it's, the, the whole design community works by mutual exploitation by consenting adults. Where you pay with a currency that you have in plenty and it's cheap for you and really valuable to them and they pay me back with stuff that's really cheap to them but really valuable to me. And that's the ultimate win-win. And there's, these types of things are conscious, they're, attentive and they're precious and having left it and been slapped down a rose and how lucky I was, I, from then on I stopped taking it for granted and really did everything I could to try and value and, 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 and spread that and, and keep going. But that's how you keep those things. And this is why sketching is so important. One of a designer I worked with when I was a musician, he designed all my sets and costumes and stuff like that when we were on the road and things like that. And, and he's a pretty well-known printmaker in, in Canada. And, and when I talked about this, he said, Bill, I can't do a critique or a crit of one thing. You can't do it. I, I, this is the first time I've used the word crit, and it's fundamental to this process, and I'm going to come to it in a minute. But the thing is this. If you come, and this is why Alistair said you have to, three isn't enough. You need five. The reason you need five different things, if you come in with five ideas without having made a decision of which one's best and without knowing which one's best, then I can talk, and you and I can talk about them objectively. You haven't made up your mind, so when I criticize one versus the other, I'm not insulting you because you have nothing invested. You've put them up as proposals, not as answers. And if you come with one thing, it is just simply asking too much of us. We're human beings, and we know enough about human behavior. If you come with one thing and I attack your idea, I'm attacking you because there's no difference between you and your idea. Come with five, it's one of the five that's on the table. And that is why sketching is so critical to the process about exploring alternatives. If you have multiples each and you need the tools and language to have that, we can have this conversation. It comes right back to conversation about all of these things so that ultimately getting to truth is more important than being right. And that's and, and where truth is defined as simply what's the best thing we can do with the budget and the time and population and so on and the circumstances. We're just simple pragmatists. We're not artists. We're not making masterpieces. We're doing design. What's our value system? What do we value? And the way we communicate all of these ideas is absolutely critical. You know, there's the tech box. There's all kinds of ways. Part of the design process in parallel with the sketching is the designer as collector. Go to any animation studio, go to any design studio. People's desks and workspaces are covered with artifacts, physical artifacts, photographs, sketches. I always have my camera with me. I'm collecting. I have toys in my briefcase I can pull out any time to illustrate concepts. You know, one of my favorites, if anybody steals this, I will murder you. This is one of my favorites. Just, I've carried this around with me for over 10 years, actually for more, for almost 20 years. Just pass this around, but I'm serious, I'm really going to be upset if I don't get it back. And one side, and feel it, and, and feel the surface difference, the, and the part that's different, and just put it on a piece of paper, pass it around, and you figure it out. You've got to experience it, because I can explain this, and it's got nothing to do with actually feeling it. You've got to experience it, or you won't get the point. It's not about thinking. It's not a intellectual exercise. Jimi Hendrix, are you experienced? If you're not, get experienced, or get a new job. The way we should, yeah? If you are just so, so hard to be able to communicate the 
experience before you have to build it. And you yes. seem to just now contradict that. No, because the whole thing about the whole thing's about provocation. eBay is one of the most useful. There's the sketching part, but the, if you, I'm happy to pull things in by skill transfer and, and analogy and stuff like that. So if I can find physical analogies, that's what this is. The, um, you collect all these artifacts, that what, what we call in the industry in, in design series, you just call reference material, shared references, that basically give us shared metaphors. From now on, everyone is taking this piece of glass. If it comes out, we're talking about pen computing and the, and the problems of parallax and also the, the, the importance of texture of the surface. If you've rubbed a pencil across the sandblasted part of that thing versus the part that's smooth, you'll understand the impact of, of, of the surface uh, you know, friction and so on, texture, and also what happens when the ink comes out of the tip of the pen instead of on the other side of the glass. You will have experienced it, and I'll have to say, it's like the faceplate technology you showed me at that talk. And every one of us, you can just say, it's like that faceplate. That's what that technology is called. And everyone in this room, that's shorthand. We now have a special language. Because we have this one compact way that for the rest of our working life, in 20 years we can come back, we'll say, it's like that faceplate. And you will not forget it, because you've experienced it. Right? It's not a cognitive. It's cognitive and visceral. And that's the, that's the kind of thing I'm, I'm, I'm trying to get at. And so we collect things, we share things, the images, the reference images, plus the things we sketch, and we just plaster the walls and the environment with them. It's not enough that, you know, everybody says design books. Oh, if we just put foam boards and cork boards around your creative. Well, no, you're not. You need this whole other ecology around design thinking that I've been talking about. And so this is a studio, this is, this is Bruce's studio, when we were doing the Massive Change show. Um, in that book you were looking at earlier, Terry, um, this, this, these are just random shots. Uh, um, you carry these things around to meetings, and, uh, and they're just stacked up all over the place. So we're, I'm, I'm wrapping up, and I, I just want to say that we're at a really interesting place in design, where these things are really becoming critical. Our practice is changing. Take something like the information appliances we have today. Where is the user interface? Where is the experience? What is the catalyst or the conduit for the experience? What is the, what is the, what is the medium of the, of the interface? And as we move away um, and, and expand our repertoire, not, not move away from, as we expand our repertoire of technology-based devices through which we, with which we interact and which find their place into our day-to-day -day life, the question is this, where does the hardware stop and the software begin in terms of the user interface? And if you're a company like Microsoft, where you're a software company primarily, if you don't control the hardware, how do you control the experience? But even in things like this, which is a Microsoft product, this is the Zoom, the people who were trained to do the hardware went to industrial design school. They understand almost everything I've talked about today. There's nothing I said that isn't familiar about the design process, sketching, ideation, dialogues, reference materials, all this sort of stuff. But the traditional industrial design training trains you not at all to deal with the temporal, dynamic, gestural, and, and this other side of things. On the other hand, the computer scientists have very good tools, for the most part, in terms of how to deal with some of the temporal things because they're experienced in programming and the HCI. They even have tools like Stu Card and others have done with the, in terms of making quick predictions and so on and so forth. Keystroke model or any time motion stuff, right back to Gil Breath and so on, and Taylorism. But they have no experience in design. They don't know what sketching is. They don't know what a crit is. They don't know any of that other stuff. And both are essential in the process, as are the software engineers who actually build the product, much less design it, none of them are, are sufficient. And they're culturally know nothing about each other's histories. How many people here with a software computer science degree know who Dreyfus is? How many of you know who, yeah, yeah Henry, um, as opposed to uh, the one that uh, Proust wrote about? Um, um, Christopher Dresser. Anybody know who Christopher Dresser is? Probably the first industrial designer ever in England. Uh, Brooks Stevens, Bill Geddes, 
Um, Raymond Louis. Anybody, who, who knows what Ray, wrote? Give me three things that Raymond Louis designed. Or two, you know. <coughs> Shell logo. Shell logo, Coca-Cola bottle, Coca-Cola logo, streamlining, Studebaker Avanti. Best, coolest car ever. Okay? So, for example, all I'm trying to say is that there's, the industrial designers would know that, but they wouldn't know who Ivan Sutherland is, who Stu Card is, who, um, you know, Terry is, right? And what I'm trying to say is it's really important in our histories. So the point is, we have this really difficult cultural gap. And as the line between the software and hardware at the interface gets blurred, we have to reconstitute our teams and how we structure things. And that's one of the biggest challenges within organizations, and then figure out where does design live within the organization. Talk to any of, any of you who are working in an industry. Ask your CEO, where, sorry, who makes design decisions in your company? How are they made? Do the people making those decisions even know they're making design decisions? Do they understand the implications of those decisions from a design perspective and in terms of branding the product and larger experience? And how comfortable are you, given that the answer is going to be really surprising or scary and, and in terms of where we're going forward? And so my sense is I'm feeling incredibly optimistic in terms of what if we adopt new processes where we actually redesign our organizations. And that's largely what I'm, that's my most important product right now, is helping redesign Microsoft as an organization, as much as any of the products or technologies I'm working on, is that we have, and is to recognize something that innovation in process has perhaps as much as a tenfold better return on investment than innovation on product. And just look at DRAMs, VCRs, LCDs, um, if you want to see who paid for that R&D and who reaped the benefits. You know, Korea did not invent any of those technologies. Just let me put it. A, the, the Dean Emeritus of the Sloan School of Management at MIT, a guy named Lester Thurlow, wrote a book called Head to Head, if you want to read a bit about that, that sort of stuff from a business perspective. But we have some real challenges, because the challenges now come down to education. They come down to within our corporate organizations and how we put these teams together. But my sense is, we're starting to see some changes. Bill's book is a really, uh, Muggeridge's book, recent book, is a really good way to start that. I hope my book contributes to that. But there's a, there's a number of, of people starting to get this, and the resources are starting to get there. We're in 1927, where an industrial design just started. That's when, when Harley Earl went to General Motors. That's when Dreyfus started his company. That's when um, Teague started his company. That's when Louis started his company in the eight period 27 to 29. What's important about these four landmark design firms in North America is that there were no industrial design schools before they started. And remember what happened in 1929. And then remember that all of those companies were still in business and thriving in the 1950s. And in fact, Louis, Raymond Lois is the only one that's no longer in business because it was so tied up with him as an individual. But the others are all still in business. Design is not an expensive luxury. It is a, a necessity to get over the, these storms and these difficult times when all the low-hanging fruit has been plucked from the tree. If we execute it properly, and I don't mean old school design, I mean design that looks forward. And especially if you start taking into account things like cradle to cradle, ecologically sound, renewable resources and all those types of things, and, and have that as primary design criteria when you go into your products. And my final book that I'll just recommend, just because he's a climber, fly fisherman, and, uh, and, and, and uh, uh, surfer is a book called Let, Let My People Go Surfing. So I got Terry to buy it today. So he'll, he'll tell you whether I'm nuts or not. But uh, it's by uh, Yvonne Schwinard, who, uh, among other things, uh, is the father of modern ice climbing. So if any of you climb waterfalls in the wintertime, then he's your, he, he is God. Say thank you to him every time you plant your pick. <laughs> and the second thing is he also is the founder of Patagonia and also the father of the one one uh, one percent for the world, uh, for the Earth uh, program, and so on and so forth. But this is a case of somebody who really is practicing design in in a way that reaches every aspect of design, from the ecological and social, uh, ethical, and other things. We can do that, and my sense is our industry is lagging behind. And I think these techniques can help. And if this talks help that, thank you very much. 
For information on other online Stanford seminars and courses, please visit study.stanford.edu. The preceding program is copyrighted by Stanford University. Please visit us at stanford.edu.